What is interpretation for you? In the News Talk account, I shared a poll a few days ago asking them what is the meaning of interpretation for them. And I got so many different answers. Some of the answers were interpretation is about understanding the work. But some people say that interpretation is about pouring your feelings and make it yours, the music yours. Some people say it's being true to the score and the time it was composed, but making it your own with the tools you have. And some people also said a word that I really love about interpretation, that is being a storyteller, telling a story through sounds. I wanted to ask you, what do you think interpretation means? And actually even better, what isn't interpretation? It's a very interesting question. There is, I mean, one, one could make a point that there is no such a thing that is not an interpretation. If we think of the, of the word and its Latin roots, actually the interpreter was the person who would be in between a commercial transaction. Let's say a, a person who's trying to sell something and the person who's trying to buy something. The person who would stand in between them and try to make the connection between those two, that would be the interpreter. It's also interesting for us to observe how uh, the word interpreter comes very often connected to the role of a translator. You think of people who do sign language, though many times are called interpreters as well. Or if you have a president who is going on a meeting with another president from another country and they don't speak the same language, they take an interpreter. So but somebody who stands in between. In art and in music, we need to understand First of all, what are the two things that people are standing in between? But if we think that somebody composed a piece of music and some sort of information that is contained, let's say, within a score and somebody who is receiving that information, anybody who stands in between that would be the interpreter, even mm -hmm. if that person is the composer themselves. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So even the, the composer would be an interpreter that translates what's going on in, on one side to another. It's it's hard to give a, a one definition of what interpretation is, mm -hmm. but as a start point, so it's what happens in the process of taking it from one point to another, in which this in music would be a composition and the listener. You know, this is one common question that I get on my account from people that don't know if they're making the right choices in their interpretation because they are so worried about what the composer mm. meant, right? This is a, a recurring topic when it comes to interpretation. And it also leads to a, a question that is, is there a right or wrong way to interpret a piece? So how do I know if I am doing the right thing? Uh, when it comes to interpretation. Every aesthetic choice that we make, that is the way that we play a piece, let's say, it will be responding to a set of values that you have. And those values, those parameters are the ones that are going to be dictating whether something is, let's say, right or wrong, depending on what the set of values that you, you are interested in and that you are um, saying that are valuable. If you, if you look at early 20th century pianists and people who were born in the 19th century, you're gonna see that they play according to a completely different set of values than let's say in the 1960s people were playing. Mm -hmm. um, yes, you can even see this, I mean, we're pianists, but I'm sure this is also true for other instruments. Yes. But if you compare like recent recordings and old, the old school of pianists, it's completely different. It sounds completely different. So it comes, it comes back to an idea of what is right and wrong ends up being what you decide is right and wrong. Mm -hmm. And of course, maybe you can make the point that it's your personal decision on what's right and wrong. You can make your own set of values and go with those set of values. And you can also put yourself, insert yourself in a set of values that is shared by a community and then see what set of values you want. What are the set of values that that community shares and then go with those. For instance, if you're playing for a an audition at your university, Maybe you're going to have want to play according to a set of values, mm -hmm. even if you agree with them or not, that those people will consider, okay, doing mm -hmm. this is right, doing this yeah. is wrong. But ultimately, it's... I don't know if there's such a thing as yeah. right or wrong. It's interesting what you said, that it's ultimately what you decide is right. But this decision could be quite a, a huge responsibility when, let's say, you're just starting, you're just starting to learn an instrument. Someone yes. even asked on this topic, how do we develop the skill to interpret pieces? that we play and I think this is a very relevant question because I personally don't believe interpretation should be reserved only for advanced musicians I think it's something that we need to start teaching 
from the very beginning, right? So how do we do this? How do we make it sound less daunting and confusing when you're just starting? Maybe the word skill isn't mm. the best word for this, mm. right? Interpretation is not a skill like playing a scale. It is a, uh, it's even hard to define it as, as something that you achieve. What I would say, however, is to feed their imagination. Yeah, yes. imagination is such an important component. I, I believe it as well for yes. interpretation, right? Yeah, so it's feeding your imagination. And I'm a strong believer of two, two specific things. One of them is feeding your imagination with a lot of knowledge about what you're doing, about mm -hmm. a, a lot of information about what's going on. And not only about the piece that you're playing, for instance, one thing that, that can be done from the start as with a piece is trying to see what were the, let's say, the conditions in which some composer composed mm -hmm. the specific piece. Like an example of this, if you understand that the third movement of the Appassionata by Beethoven, mm -hmm. uh, there is this description by Ferdinand Ries, who was one of Beethoven's students, that they were once taking taking a walk and Beethoven was humming to himself all, all of the time and just singing and stuff like this. And then as soon as they got home, Beethoven rushed to the piano and started improvising. And then he said, what, 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 what's happening, Maestro? What is this? And then Beethoven said, oh, I got the third movement of this, the new sonata. We won't be having a lesson today because I have work to do. <laughs> So this this is an interesting kind of information because it starts to to put you in the mindset of oh maybe this third movement is much more an interpret uh, an improvisation that comes mm -hmm. from some sort of weird imagination feeling. Researching about not only the work that you're practicing but the history of that composer of that era that century can enrich your understanding of the piece and ultimately also your imagination. And on that topic. Uh, Susan Tomes, uh, the writer of one of the books that I will share in this document with all the resources. She shares three exercises on her book to enhance the imagination in her even beginner students. That is, one, if your piece could speak, what would it say? And I love this one because it reminds me of the storyteller definition that someone said at the beginning. Another exercise is if you could associate this piece with feelings, words, colors, or even places, what would it be? And this is, is also aligned with many uh, programmatic works that exist from Ravel to Debussy and Liszt, right? who uh, make parallels with other works of arts and even in the title of their pieces. And the title of the works that we practice is also a great way to start this, um, this process to craft your interpretation of the piece. And the last one that I really liked is if you had to imitate a famous musician playing this, how would you play? So, uh -huh. you know, Sasha Heifetz, Rostropovich, Maria Callas, Martha Argerich, any musician that you really admire. I love this one because even the gestures or the movement could be an expressive resource when it comes to interpretation. But this other thing that I was going to mention is something that I think is as important as acquiring a lot of knowledge, which is talking to people. Wow. Um, and that's why usually music universities and conservatories are so are so beneficial. Many times, not because of the teachers you're going to have, but because of the fact that you're going to meet a lot of people and you can have conversations about it. I don't know. I mean, you, you and I, for instance, we've spent so much time on mm -hmm. the phone just yes. talking about music. Such you know? nerds, right? <laughs> no, yes, we would would call each other at two in the morning and be yeah. four hours on the, on the phone talking. Oh, you saw that interpretation of somebody who played. <laughs> Those do a thing that uh, actually this term was was told to me by Robert Hill. He says that these kinds of conversations they sharpen your ears because you you start nourishing something so at the end interpretation is something that you nourish the skill of interpretation is if there's such a thing and that's another reason why i think it's so important to raise this kind of discussion because just practicing is not going to make you make it sound like music unless like practice which is what we want right to sound to be more expressive and to make this music sound alive as people keep saying about interpretation but if you just spend all your time focusing on the notes, but you don't develop all of these others, let's use this word skill, uh, with these other ways to understand the piece, be it the, its historical context, 
or uh, chatting or talking, reflecting with your friends and peers, then you're not going to develop this deep understanding of the piece in order to make it your own, right? Which is a recurring topic that I see many musicians talking on the Instagram account that is making it your own, that is pouring your feelings into it. Mm -hmm. How can we make sure that people in the public at a concert understand the interpretation that we're making of the piece and comprehend its intention. And how can we make sure we cannot? That's the, I would first, we cannot. This is something that I have understood after really trying to, to think, to control the audience into doing something. The thing is, you cannot control how every person in the audience will feel. And that is and the there, magic of interpretation of music, right? Yes. It's it's so open to everybody's interpretation of what they're and exactly to. because it even goes to this double meaning of the word interpretation, in which okay, we can interpret something outwards to, to from us to outside of us as interpreters, but also when you're listening to something, maybe you you are interpreting it as well in your own way. I, I wanted the audience to be able to connect to what was happening on stage orally and to understand the storytelling that was happening in the in the piece that I was playing. I, I, it was focused on Chopin's first ballad. Mm -hmm. And what I did is I spoke. It's a melologue. Melologue. So, and that's very interesting. I actually spoke and played at the same time. Talking to Luca Chiantore, I discovered this thing called the melologue, which was a huge tradition in the 19th century that put together music and spoken words, not sung words. Throughout the 19th century, that became so famous and such a, uh, uh, an important thing that Schumann loved metalogues and started composing his own metalogues. And Liszt came to a point in which he wanted to be the one who speak, to be the actor in his own metalogues. Even before that, Mozart, for instance, there's a letter to his father in which he says, I went to see these two metalogues and I didn't think that the putting music and spoken words together was a good idea, but this was so amazing that I'm going to base all my operas in this idea. So it was a big thing in the 19th century and the 20th century with its idea of pure music and classical music has to be in a certain way completely stopped that. What I did was that I went, I came back with the melologue with an idea of explaining to the audience something about the music and illustrating it with the music at the moment. Yeah, so then by explaining and then actually talking to them, if you, yeah. if you want. To, I mean, uh, there are other ways to kind of, I like this word you use, to guide the audience interpretation of your performance, right? Other than with words. I, I yeah. see several musicians, for instance, using their body, like making big movements, you know? For instance, uh, there is a TED talk by Benjamin Zander, and uh, at some he started imitating a beginner, intermediate player uh, performing the piano. And then when it comes to the advanced musician, he starts playing with gestures like that, which brings one to think, what is interpretation? interpretation for him is that like moving a lot and there are some musicians that tend to move a lot when they perform right it's another way yeah. to to guide uh how the listeners into understanding of that that performance right some people even complain about this because they prefer not to give any informational additional information to the audience other than the sounds the music this takes us to an interesting area of studies um called the the performance studies which is this sort of mixture between theater studies and anthropology, sociology, and musicology also. Uh, it actually began with a, with a theater director and theater guy called Richard Sheshner, and then with an anthropologist called Victor Turner. And what they, under, what they started to understand is that performances are not only what is going on on stage, but also all of the settings that happen around it. So for instance, uh, if we go to a classical music concert at a concert hall, the way that we dress, the way that somebody walks on stage, all of this is creating us, it's giving information to mm -hmm. how we should listen to this music and how we are to feel about it. All of this is a certain kind of performance that you're doing with your body, even though you say that when you sit at the piano, you don't make long, long sort of gestures. If you sit at the piano like this and you play like this and you have a certain kind of posture, those are also body body gestures that are making your audience understand your interpretation in a certain way. Mm -hmm. And they are part of an interpretation. 
And and this connects a lot with an idea co- uh, by a, a another musicologist called Philip Auslander. You are performing a certain kind of attitude when you play as a musician, which is almost it's not a character per se because you're not necessarily portraying something somebody else, but it is a version of yourself that has as much meaning as if you were being a character or something. So it's not only about what happens through the music with the sounds, but everything there is connected to how meaning reaches the audience. I think the more we become experienced, the more our interpretation goes beyond our instrument. When we start, our interpretation is all about playing the notes and understanding the score. And then you become progressively more aware of your whole body and then of the whole stage and then of the whole theater. And you see interpreters wearing like amazing dresses or work in collaboration with other artists and uh, making some uh, visuals and projections. And this gives a completely different understanding of the work, yeah. right? Mm-hmm. We perceive this even mm-hmm. unconsciously. If we go to a concert hall and we have to dress in a certain way and, and we cannot clap in between movements and we have to be absolutely quiet and somebody comes on stage like this, we, we have a certain kind of impression. While if somebody comes and takes a microphone and looks at us and says, well, what, what was it that I played? We have a completely different kind of relationship with, which, with what's mm-hmm. going on. Going back, coming back one last time to this question about how can we make the audience understand, I agree with you that we can do such a thing. All we can do is suggest This is how I understand it. This is how I make it my own. I remember I was once watching a masterclass with Wolfgang Rieger, which is Mm -hmm. a German pianist that works a lot with singers. And at some point he says something so beautiful. When, When you follow what you imagine, what you believe, it doesn't matter what other people think because it's true. So I think ultimately this is... For me, what I believe a successful interpretation performance for me is when I'm able to meet this truth. You know, this is how I wanted it to sound and I'm able to play it like that. This is the most difficult thing for me, actually, is to first envision the sound that I want. And this is something that I work a lot with my students, because how come we sit at our pianos or with our violins or cellos and try to play the notes if we don't even before that imagine envision the sound or the emotion or the character that we want to create, right? In the inner game of music, Barry Green's talking about that all the time. He says that if you imagine it clearly, then making it, playing it is going to be much easier because it's it's yeah. guided by this musical goal that you had, this musical result that you envisioned in the first place. So this is something that I work a lot with my students before they start playing. Can you sing for me? What is it? How do you want this melody to sound like? What is the character of this excerpt here, of this chord progression here? Explain to me with words, with colors, or just singing. And most of the time, we realize together that they have absolutely no idea of how they Mm -hmm. want it to sound. And that's why it's so important to take this time to make some research, talk with people, to listen as simple as listening to recordings you can i also tell them make a playlist of all the recordings different interpretations of the piece you're practicing even the ones you don't like and just mm-hmm. listen to them at all times when you're cooking when you're in your car going to the faculty to your work whatever because these are several ways that you have to envision this sound and create this soundscape in your mind, which is going to make it much more easier when you sit with your instrument to play it and to read the notes, right? It, this touches interesting things, uh, this idea, and I love this. Uh, I do the same things with, with my students of, okay, actually, what, what is going on here? What do you think? What is the character of this, right? And this touches two very important uh, subjects. One of them 
it has to do with the presence with what you're doing and the presence that you have with every aspect of what you're doing. So first you said, well, we first are very concerned about playing the notes and then we start being more also concerned about the stage and we start being present with other parts of our of our environment and of our playing. But of course, the presence can also be happening with the music itself. Are you actually present and being very specific with like how much pedal you're putting with this or where is your phrase going and how's your voicing? After you're actually present with every aspect and you have thought about okay i want this phrase to go this way i want these notes to go this way this character for me is this and that then you have to make a decision and commit to that decision and that takes a lot of courage this is one of my biggest difficulties actually because many times i see so many ways of playing a passage and there are so many ideas of okay this could go this way and that way and that is actually really really hard to go and say okay no at least this one time I'm going to play it this way. When you figure out, okay, I know what I want to do, then there's a second problem. Which one am I going to choose, right? And it actually leads me to the next question. I think from even our talk, interpretation is such a deep topic that can go deep into philosophy and can become super abstract. Yet, I don't think interpretation and being expressive is something that we shouldn't teach to beginners and thus as pedagogues as musicians but also as teachers i think it's very important that we find or that we build certain systems so that people can become more used to using their imagination when practicing the repertoire. There is an anecdote from Susan Tome's book that I love. It's a chapter from her book that is called, for me, this sounds like jazz. So she comes, there is a new student that comes to her studio and he's playing a Debussy prelude right? And Debussy's music sounds very uh, magical and very free, you know? And this student starts playing, no, it's nothing like what's written on the score. Even the rhythms and notes are completely different. And she doesn't understand why. I mean, he can read the score, but somehow he's not playing anything that's written. He's almost improvising. And she asks him why he's doing that. And he says, well, for me, this sounds like jazz. For me, Debussy wanted it to sound... He didn't care very much, actually, how people played his piece. And she was shocked. I mean, she she visited the composer's house and she, and she tells us how, by seeing how difficult it was at that time, without all the technology that we have, like music notation softwares, they didn't have that at the time. They were writing note after note. Imagine writing a symphony, all the instruments with all the pen and almost no light, daylight. One would really make all that effort to write down if it was really meaningful for the composer. I don't have like a, 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 an opinion about this, if you should be absolutely true to what's written on the score, because, well, this is something that you research as well, right? The score that we have, we can never know, actually, if that is what the composer wanted. However, I think there is a middle ground. You know, there is a way that mm -hmm. we can understand the score. And for me, that is the first step with my beginner students, is making sure that everything that is written on the score, they are able to understand it. And I have some very simple exercises that I do with them. For instance, I call it the layers, the three layers. The first layer is notes, rhythms, and fingerings. Just that there, they don't do the right rhythms. They notice they were they didn't have the right sustained notes and etc. And once they figure that out, then comes the second layer. So this was the skeleton. The second layer is like the muscles. And the muscles are dynamics, articulation, and tempo markings. So I asked them to just highlight this in their score. And they never notice these markings. They never saw that. Never. It's like completely new. When they do that in front of me, it's like, oh, what? What does that mean? Why is there a decrescendo here, but then a forte? What does that mean? And there is the work of interpretation for me. It's really looking at the score without trying to bore your feelings or interpretation. And just come to the score. Take it as a historical document and try to understand it. Everything that is written. This is the interpretation that is taking place. For me, a decrescendo and a forte could mean like a surprise. 
but for some people it could be a slow progression i mean there's just so much space i think many people mm -hmm. think that when we look at the score we feel somewhat restricted and limited but actually when you take care and you really um, try to interpret the score you realize that there is just so much space for interpretation to understand and try to interpret what is written in that piece of paper and translate it to emotions and the final step which is the skin i like to call it making it sound like your own right so voice seeing how the, putting the emotions that you attribute to this interpretation of what's written in the score so of course this is not the absolute right way to do it this is how i do it because i think this is an easy step-by-step -step way to teach beginners how to, at the same time, understand the score, but nurture their understanding and imagination of what they're playing and making it their own. Because for me, it all starts from understanding, deep understanding of the work. People And actually, what's happening there is that you're making them more present with what is, with what is going on. Right, mm -hmm. they, they they start to speak that language more fluently, and then therefore, if you can speak something a language fluently, then you can express yourself in that language much more sincerely. There are many problems that we can start to to ask ourselves, and many questions of like, okay, actually, first of all, what is written in the score? Does it re represent any sort of truth? Mm -hmm. And actually, what is written on the score? And only trying to understand this already also changes a lot, um, depending on who compose who's the composer and when is the composer from and where is the composer from because even if we look at 18th century music there are so many things written in the score that people at the time understood them in a certain way but nowadays we understand conventions them right different. that they didn't have to write it down because at the exactly. time they understood it yeah i think things as as big as like what's the instrumentation even like pieces for orchestra that didn't didn't have on the general score parts for the oboe or for the, the trumpets for the horns or the timpani but we know that if they were available at the time the uh, an oboist would play that that piece and it's interesting for instance to look at certain pieces by Handel for instance in which you see the whole score and then it's only like strings and singers and then suddenly in the middle he writes in, in on top of a violin part without the oboe. And you're like, but there was no oboe from the beginning. Where is the oboe coming from? But things so so important nowadays to us, it's so obvious that an oboe would be printed out on, on the page, but there it would not. And again, where the 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 place of knowledge to do and of research to to make your imagination work more is to look at those scores with an understanding of what specific signs mean. And things as also ele elementary as rhythm many times are completely different in 18th and early 19th century scores. Um, notes that are written sometimes as a quarter note, actually they were played shorter. Shorter by how much? I don't yeah. know. I remember watching this this rehearsal here um, in, in Barcelona with Lorenzo Coppola. Lorenzo Coppola is a great uh, clarinetist and a brilliant mind, and brilliant teacher, and he was rehearsing a, a student orchestra. He was working with all of these details of notation and making sure that even advanced musicians were looking at the score and actually being able to tell. He could tell that people were a little bit unease, uneasy and, and not feeling very comfortable. He said, well, you guys might be thinking, who's this crazy man here who is telling me, well, I clearly see two eighth notes and he's telling me to play an eighth note and a, and a sixteenth note. What is this? When he's telling me, I see two eighth notes, I'm going to play two eighth notes. And he looked at them and he said, well, welcome to the world of beauty. But I think the takeaway from all of our conversation so far about interpretation is that I think we can agree that it's not something that you can hone if you just sit with your instrument. If you, you are not going, if you want to make it your own, you need to understand it. And to really deeply understand it, you need to go beyond your instrument and beyond the score with the history, the composers, flexing about the work and even what is written on the score and what it could mean and how do you interpret right we've also mentioned that the score is a, even though we it might not always be so accurate is a, an amazing starting point to start your work your in, 
of interpretation of imagination in trying to understand the symbols that oh, you yes. have right there in the score, right? And I think this is an excellent starting point, not only for beginners, but even for advanced musicians that very often ignore what is written or don't really play, pay close attention and take the time to try to interpret what is written, right? All that is written, not just the notes, not just the rhythms. Uh, the title of the work, uh, articulation, oh, yes. dynamics, everything. There's just so much history that is hidden in those symbols that we think are just trying to limit us. And that I, I don't think one thing hinders the other one from happening. I don't think it's not because you're working on the score that you can have pour your feelings into it. Actually, it's like a guide, right? You're understanding it, and the way you understand it is going to be completely different from how my student understands it, right? Yes, but of course we have to understand that we will always understand what a score means through a set of, of parameters that we've established. Even with some pianists, with some very different pianists, if you put them all playing a Mozart sonata, it's difficult to say who is who. And that has to do with a, with a 20th century approach to, to classical music and yeah. to mm -hmm. the score being a, being a closed thing. To, for me, I always see the, the score as the, the, app, the starting point for something to happen, which is very much what happened in, in 19th century mm -hmm. uh, performance. 19th century performance understood the score as even as a challenge to see how they could put themselves in there mm -hmm. of course to understand what was going on mm -hmm. and that also to understand what is going on means to understand that many things there are in there are not exact don't do not exactly mean what is literally absolutely on. and there is where the research comes in right yes. the role of research in crafting our interpretation it's extremely now, it's fundamental you, we're talking about nourishing our interpretation in uh, outside of, of, of the, the instrument. We're talking a lot about colors or what does this piece say? And that is a way of making the music sort of go beyond its musical realm to, to give it a certain character. Mm -hmm. And that is, for me, that's a very, very powerful tool. Mm -hmm. I love the way of the play with colors. I remember trying to play one same passage. Okay, I'm gonna play it blue. I'm now gonna play it red. I'm gonna play it yellow to see what's happened. What happens with the same passage? Mm -hmm. And even in chamber music, I had chamber music partners in, with which I would do this. And one thing that actually Luca Cantori was the one who pointed out that one to me is to have certain passages of music be mimic mimes, mm -hmm. body gestures. So if you think of like the beginning, I don't know, of Schumann's fantasy of being and then you think, okay, this is the kind of thing that I want. And this is something that I like to to ask students um, to, to, to think about. I work a lot with imagery, with uh, paintings, for instance. I think this Painting. is a really cool resource that even some composers work with and even compose their works based on paintings, uh, yes. like Rachmaninoff's Isle of, of Death. Right. Dial death, yes. So you have this oh, famous Mussorgsky, the... Yeah, absolutely. And the you Russian. also have composers like Chopin who very often worked with famous painters like Delacroix, etc. Yes. So I think painting and music have a lot of a lot of parallels. There is one last question from the chat. Pedro, would there be a limit defining what is acceptable and what is not when an interpreter is trying to perform a piece in a different way? First of all, yes, there is a limit. If you're somebody who's trying to do something different with music and, and, and interpret something in a different way, I think that that limit should be self-imposed. Of course, for every artistic creation, it is interesting to have parameters with which you're, you're working. Mm -hmm. And uh, in academic research, we usually call this the, the theoretical framework of a research. So what are actually the concepts that you're working with here? But of course, you're the one who ends up choosing what what actually your mm -hmm. values and what your limits are. In some contexts, you're not going to play Mozart making all sorts of improvisation. If you're playing for your doctorate or master's uh, exam, final exam, right? Because you know that the jury is listening to that and their purpose there is to try to see if you really understood what they were trying to teach you, the, the basis. First, I was very angry at this. We're so limited at the faculty. I mean, we can't create stuff. But 
Nowadays, I realize the importance of making sure that you have this foundational, you know, knowledge. In that context, not following or trying to apply rather what you understood about the composers that era. I think it's it's not the be best context to do yes, to take such yes. liberties. At the same time, I think this should encourage musicians to not only rely on recitals and class concerts and possibilities within the university to create their own projects. And I yes. think this is a very problem um, with music students that most of them don't take action to go beyond and connect with people and start their own projects and contact, you know, places, pubs, even restaurants, lounges. I don't know, start small, you know, or even a, an Instagram account like I did, which is your space to be creative because even creativity and imagination is something that you nurture, that you train that you develop, right? And if you give your, you don't give yourself these occasions and these spaces to be creative without juries or teacher, just how you understand the world, how you understand music, uh, I think it's going to be very difficult for you to develop that, to nurture that skill, which for me is a skill, imagination. If you just rely on your exams, your master exams, your bachelor exams and class recitals, the internet yes. is an amazing space to do that because <laughs> you can do whatever you want and create and be creative and I absolutely love that. We also have to understand that those faculties they are th those teachers they are also following certain a certain kind of values and, and certain kind of parameters that not, not, not necessarily are even true mm -hmm. but you have to be smart also to, to, to yeah, see what, absolutely. what I think it's even more than smart it's just take what you can learn from that yeah, you know yes. and you can't learn anything if from the very beginning you're not willing to listen. Thank you again Pedro I'll see you next time. Bye-bye. Yes, thank you so much.